Hey, Victoria here from Better Bedtime Stories, the podcast that brings magic into parents' and kids' lives through storytelling. Today, I'm talking with Gila, the co-founder of Dar Chocolate. It's D-A-R, artisan chocolate based in Denver. You know, chocolate is such an important part of my son's life. And it was only after I met Gila, I was introduced to the creative part of making your own chocolate from bean to bar. Gila is one of the most creative people I know, and she introduced me to the magic of birth songs. So what is a birth song? When Gila was pregnant, she worked with a voice coach who helped her craft the perfect lullaby for her daughter. That is such a cool idea, right? But before we jump into this, I was really curious to know what makes the perfect chocolate. And at the end of the episode, I will share my son's favorite bedtime story about chocolate. Chocolate is not just flavor. Chocolate is a texture. Chocolate is a movement in your mouth that's different than other foods. It has its own kind of uh, characteristic, right? Like melting it, it's warm. Depending on the quality of the chocolate, flavors can come, emerge, dissipate. You know, they're, it, like you're going through a little flavor journey. So it's all of those things together. That's what makes a perfect chocolate. Oh, that's a good one. How old was your daughter when you decided to start your chocolate company? She was eight. She was eight. So this is a good age for just demanding chocolate. Like, <laughs> no, you know what? She, she's not into our chocolate. What? She is not into our chocolate because she, um, I think it has, it's a complex thing. It has to do with, oh, this is my parents thing, right? Mm. No, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm different, right? And um, I think for kids, there's something about the, wait, let me get it right. I think maybe she was nine already when we started with that, but. But she likes the she likes the sweet and the the milky. And our chocolates, by definition, want to bring out the, the true flavor of the cacao. So it's not about being sweet or milky. The sweetness just helps to create the perfect balance between the flavor and the sweetness. And it doesn't taste like for people who I grew up on Hershey bars, for example, which is me too, because I, I was in the United States until the age of five. And then when we moved to Israel, anybody who went to America was like, bring, bring some Snickers, bring some Hershey bars, you know. <laughs> it has a very distinct flavor. And Hershey's will always make sure that this is the flavor, no matter what cocoa beans they get. They need that flavor. For us, it's the total opposite. Different beans have different notes, different flavors. So for someone who, you know, has that Hershey kind of craving, you taste this single origin chocolate or origin chocolate and it's, that's, that's a weird flavor, you know, it doesn't fit into what, what is expected. I would imagine the kind of chocolate you kept at home just for you before you started the company. So she would grow up with the kind of chocolate that is a bit more kind of sophisticated or maybe... No? Yeah, the way we got to chocolate is not because we were chocolate, chocolate lovers or chocoholics. Oh. It was not at all. I, my husband was a, um, a, a film producer and I was a graphic designer and an illustrator. And in 2014, we left Israel and we went to the United States. I am a citizen and so is my daughter. Uh, my husband came in as a tourist, but we're a family that's coming to settle in the United States. But here my husband has a tourist visa, mm -hmm. even though we were married. But, you know, there's a whole green card process to go through. And they took him aside to interrogate him. And they did that for six hours and they sent him back to Israel. Oh, my God. So you were there with your daughter. How old yes. was she? She was um, eight then she was oh, eight. All right. Oh, so you moved and then this is the thing that you decided to start quick, like pretty quickly afterwards. So immigration wasn't a big enough adventure. So you said, hey, 
<laughs> no, no, because he, the, 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 we said, okay, we got to do the green card. The lawyer said it's going to take a year. We said, okay, what are we going to do for a year? My daughter and I were in California for three months and then we met, we reunited in Costa Rica because he couldn't come into the United States. Oh my God. Until he had his green card. And so we were like, okay, we're in Costa Rica. We were on Nosara. Suddenly you discover there's this tree and there's this fruit and the way it's connected to the tree. And when you open it, there's this white pulp inside. It's like lychee and it's so delicious. And then there are those beans inside and that's, that's what they do. They take these and they got to ferment them and dry them and then you grind them. And then that's, that's how chocolate is made. And we're like, okay, so maybe we'll buy some land. Maybe we'll buy, you know, a, a cacao plantation. Well, that didn't really, you know, it was an idea, another idea, mm -hmm. yes. but we ended up learning how to make chocolate from the beans. We went to the other coast, to the East Coast, to Puerto Viejo, and there we spent these two weeks of just learning with this guy called Paul Johnson. And we went around Costa Rica and saw, you know, different cacao plantations. And we, we went and saw, met with the farmers. And so we got really immersed into this whole, like the roots of cacao. And that's, so it was a blessing in disguise. Can you take me back to one of these uh, ceremonies, like the first time that it blew your mind? What was it like? I didn't do the ceremony. Oh, then how did you get into the whole I thing? went, I went to, we went to one ceremony because we wanted to see what it was like. How did we get into it? Because one of the guys, the Israeli guys who lived at the Pachamama, um, he had a bag of these cocoa beans and he said, I want to sell these to Whole Foods. And so he was, he was having these conversations with my partner, Joel, and he wanted to uh, just kind of, you know, they were talking about, well, how is he going to do it? Blah, blah, blah. Who is he meeting with? And he gave me some, he made me a smoothie from it. Now these were cocoa beans that were, um, uh, what they weren't, they were kind of raw cacao, I'd say. Um, they called them fruity fruity cacao because they were not fermented and what does it mean flavor wise because i don't think a lot of people actually tried an actual uh, cocoa fruit <laughs> not good it's not good <laughs> no <laughs> i wonder how they discovered you can make such a delicious thing out of it <laughs> um that is an interesting question because they at some point they must have been thrown into a fire or something and some aromas were starting to come up that really, you know, tickle the senses. But these fruity beans were not tasty, but he would throw them into a smoothie and add, you know, honey and I don't know, a few other spices and some like almond milk. And, and he was like, this is a superfood. I was like, oh, cool, I'm gonna do this every day. You know, he said, just, just do two beans a day. You just need two cocoa beans a day. I did that for a month. And it, it was not good for my intestines. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So I have my relationship with that whole like ceremonial cacao, raw cacao um, is not, uh, doesn't fit into my chocolate agenda at all. Okay. But there's a whole stream out there of people who that's, that's their thing, you know, but not, not mine. <laughs> yeah. You say superfood and you need only two a day. And I'm thinking, about the whole supplement industry. And I'm like, okay, just two a day. I can do two a day. <laughs> well, I couldn't apparently, right? But that, that you know, that, uh, that tickled our uh, curiosity. Like, okay, like we want to know more. We just, we followed our, our curiosity. We, we, were, we traveled, we traveled in the root of cacao, so to speak until we got, you know, we were like, okay, we want to learn how to make chocolate. And that's how we got to the East Coast of Costa Rica. So is it just because it's such a prominent thing in that area and you got kind of swapped by it? Or like if you visit the Netherlands, it's the cheese, you know, it's all about yes. the cheese. So right. I wonder if it's the same that you just see it everywhere and it seems so exotic and so interesting and then you're kind of drawn into it. Uh, it's not that you see it everywhere. I must say Costa Rica used to be a huge producer of cacao or a big one. And today they're not even 1% of the cacao of the world is coming from Costa Rica. 
uh, it's because a lot of the plantations have been hit by this. Um, uh, it's a I don't know if it's a fungus or an insect. It's called monelia, and it's oh. very contagious. It just like fire can go through the trees, and it really eats away at whole plantations. And so many farmers swap to corn, um, uh, maybe ananas, um, what else? The things that grow well in Costa Rica, but um, that's that's what happened in Costa Rica. But um, because as you know these westerners right being exposed to this world of cacao the whole story of it like how we're how it's growing and how you make the chocolate it just blew our mind and we were looking for you know a new phase in our life it was like okay let's do this it just was a good connection so you're there with an eight-year-old girl yeah in a new country <laughs> <laughs> kind of figuring out where you're going and then this chocolate thing becomes a thing so how how did you explain this to your daughter I didn't have to explain just she just she just flowed with whatever I mean her the story of her life is to flow with that's how she was born as well she was she was like a flow <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> yes, uh, the 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 doctor who saw her when she was teeny tiny, and she saw her skull. You know how they have that thing going on with the skull being very mm -hmm. flexible. Yeah. She said, "Your her skull is very flexible. She was very considerate." So oh, she... that's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so all these twists and turns from the moment we left israel you know she went through several schools even when we came to costa rica she switched schools twice so getting into the chocolate was just another adventure i mean we went to these beautiful places and tasting and i think she was very enthusiastic about this idea right we're making chocolate and she met um this when we were doing when we were learning the workshop the person who taught us had a young boy so there was this boy that she connected to so she has this whole memory of this very rich experience from that time when we were you know learning and living chocolate i even have a picture of her um chocolate on her face <laughs> tasting um from Costa Rica, yeah, um, with our teacher kind of teaching her how to make a ganache. And so it was a very, uh, it was like a rich learning time, but she does not love our chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, a parents of, um, you have these incredible uh, superstars, you know, and their kids are like, no. I look at like uh, uh, Beyonce's kids and they're like, no, nah. <laughs> <laughs> go figure. <laughs> I'm sure when she gets a little older and she will be the heiress of yeah. if, unless we sell before that. Right. But um, she, I think she has a place in her mind where she's looking forward to being the owner of the chocolate company. You know, yeah, there is a pride. It's like a second generation already. This is quite incredible. She, yeah, I'll just add that she did say to me like a few months ago, she said, you know, mom, I'm starting to be really proud of the fact that my parents own a chocolate company. Oh, that's good. And how old is she now? Now she's going to be 16 in September. Oh, wow. Getting getting such a compliment from a 16 year old. I think it's a great <laughs> achievement. Yes. <laughs> For you, this is amazing. So take me back to that first experience of you making chocolate uh in costa rica when we were learning or when we came to denver and started our own chocolate company was a different experience because if it was i want to hear both well when we were in costa rica we had our teacher right so he was just kind of guiding us through and uh I, I mean, the memories are ha I have are very visual. I don't have like a em I, I don't have a strong emotion emotional memory. Um, uh, for me, the time in Costa Rica was um, as much as rich and exciting as it, exciting as it sounds. It was also for me a time of like 
this isn't my place. I don't know the language. I didn't know Spanish. My husband knew, knows Portuguese, so Spanish and Portuguese are very easy to. Um, and as immersed as I was in nature, which is forever an experience that lives within me, it was very powerful. The life there is very agricultural. And I'm like, I'm a city girl kind of thing. And it was really lacking for me like not having all the cultural excitement going on. And so it was like, okay, uh, when can we leave Costa Rica? <laughs> <laughs> then when we, we were starting to plan our move, our, at the beginning, beginning when we left Israel, we were heading to California. My sister lives there. But once we became these, uh, chocolate makers it was like okay well california is has a lot of craft chocolate makers so for some reason in california they there's a lot uh so for business wise that's not a smart move to go to california so it's like okay i started doing some research and found denver i mean denver was an option because my husband knew denver he thought it's a cool city that's not you know overly expensive and all that so Okay, Denver had two other craft chocolate makers. I said, okay, that's that's not bad for competition. Let's go to Denver. <laughs> and in Denver, we took a, an apartment. We started out living in an apartment, but we have a garage because we knew we have to start out in our garage. And we got a little melanger and we got our chocolate molds. And for me, the excitement was about making the logo and the design of the packaging. Of and the name and you know that aspect was for me the most and I, i'll tell you the most exciting part for me about the chocolate was discovering blue mart what is that so blue mart that's a name that we gave it when chocolate is not tempered and it sits it starts to solidify the fat molecules will um, separate from the cacao solids and create these designs on the surface of the chocolate. So think about it like the geo of chocolate, you know, like the minerals in the rocks or the clouds yeah, yeah, in the yeah. sky, the formations. Mm -hmm. And it creates these awesome designs. Now, because I'm a visual, I'm, I'm a visual artist, right? I look at these and I see things just like when we look at clouds and we see the faces or whatever. And I would start taking pictures of those things. It would just turn me on so much and we um, ended up putting like I'd, I'd put like this frame around each one, give them a name and put them on the inside of our packaging. Why on the inside, not on the outside? Because the first thing is that as craft chocolate makers, we were looking at what other craft chocolate makers are doing. Like what's it's like, okay, what's, what's the language? What's the visual language that is being used that will convey that this is the kind of chocolate we're making and not, you know, the other kind. Because the other kind put always picture of a chocolate, of chocolate flowing, the fruit that they're in, right, all that. No, the craft chocolate makers are about a totally different look. It's more, it's more, think about, you know, the wine industry, okay? So we wanted something very elegant, fine on the outside, and the Blue Mart has something like, I think it's kind of like either you're mesmerized by it or you think it's a little bit of a Geiger-ish, Geiger right? <laughs> a little bit like, a, um, it's, it, it, I think when people understand how, what, how it's happening, then they get wow. But for many people to see it the first time, it could be a little weird. So it's, it's imagery that is like not... Okay, again, with this idea of like, we want to appeal to many people, right? Um, yeah, so we put it on the inside. All right. So the whole experience was you were creating this chocolate in your garage. And meanwhile, the artist in you was kind of thinking about the whole packaging and how to do it. And how, what, what, how do you start to make your chocolate? Where do you get the beans from? How, how do you do the whole thing? Do you use like a regular kitchen oven? Did you have to buy equipment? How does that work? Um, first of all, I, I want to say, I just want to mention that my husband being a film producer, he's the guy who makes things happen. Okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> because if it, were if it were left to me, it, it, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> 
so the idea of getting beans, right? So I think uh, one of the first beans, we, we made uh, two important contacts. One was with this, this Venezuelan woman who run, uh, manages a farm in Venezuela. And what, what typically happens in this industry is uh, you'll get maybe a kilo or two of cacao beans. And then, you know, they'll give that to you as a sample. And then you do a test in your kitchen to see how good the chocolate, you know, what good, how, what, how tasty the chocolate comes out from those beans. The tastiness of the chocolate depends on several factors. The first one is the fermentation. I'm kind of sidetracking here, not answering your question quite yet, but you asked me how you get your beans. So this is, I'm explaining, because to choose beans, it's not just, oh, you have a bag of beans. Okay, yalla, let's make chocolate. No, um, if you're savvy enough, you get into the small details that starts with checking how well the beans were fermented. So fermentation happens on the farm. So that's out of our control. But what we'll do is we have to, we take the bean and we have to cut it down the middle. And then you open it and you look inside and you can see how well the fermentation was. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can see. We see, oh, okay, these are good, well-fermented beans. Okay, um, then you do roasting tests. So the oven, so the oven, uh, we start out with our convection oven up in our real kitchen, I mean, our own house kitchen. Um, and you try, there's a certain range of temperature that that's the right temperature for the beans. They're quite delicate. You know, think putting roasting almonds, for example. Mm -hmm. They're very delicate, right? Um, and then you put that and uh, try at this temperature for that long, that temperature. You know, you do several tests. Everything is documented so that you remember later. And, okay, uh, you have maybe, let's say, three different roasts. And each one, uh, the beans have to be what's called winnowed. Um, winnowing is also again think about almonds how they have that husk mm -hmm. right so you got to got to separate that husk from the bean because it's um it, it's bitter the husk is bitter you don't want that in your chocolate at least as much as you can so um i'd say that was one of our first places where we're like okay how do you do it uh with a a, a uh, with a fan like you kind of chop them up and then with a fan you drop them and the husk will blow away or um, our teacher taught us away with um, you have to get them chopped up in like a big grinding machine uh, not a big one but a grinding machine let's say like a meat grinder okay so get them kind of chopped up into nibs and then with a uh, um, yeah like like a strainer okay but it's big and wide and kind of shake it through so that the husk stays on top and the nibs fall down. That's another method. Um, and then there's the third method that he also taught us is that you construct something with a vacuum cleaner and you have the grinder and as they're grinding and going down, then the vacuum cleaner will suck out the husk and then they'll fall there. And we had to build that ourselves. So, you know, getting into this whole like machine construction thing which is totally out of our league right but we did it because you go online and you see some someone out there gave instructions so that's one thing once you have those nibs without the husk you have to put them into the grinding machine which is a stone grinder um so we had a, this little one and it's grinding it's going like for two days two days of grinding and that's all happening down in our basement and the smells are starting to come up you know and you open the door to the stairway down and it's like oh you smell the chocolate oh, wow. and <laughs> and uh um in the summertime i mean when it started to get hot we started to have issues with moth growing in the cacao, um, coming to the cacao. So, and there, once we caught a mouse, so, you know, like you have all these things to deal with in these um, um, circumstances that are not, uh, not made for um, kitchen, you know, making stuff to, 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 to sell to people, but it was all okay because Colorado has what's called the Kitchen Food Act, which allows under certain quantities to be produced 
at home. So it was okay, but we had to deal with these things. Then the biggest thing is the tempering. And that's how we got into this whole bloom art thing because tempering is such a delicate, such a delicate um, science, art and science. I don't think it's an art. It's more like a, such a delicate craft in, in science. And so mastering that was probably the biggest hardship. And it's enough that the temperature outside is changing and it changes just the timing and the, 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 the delicate timing for, for when the chocolate is ready to be poured into the mold is just, wow, that was like the biggest, the biggest challenge. And it was, um, I don't know, I think apropos tension, that was maybe like the biggest tension creator that also really engages into this whole craft and makes it kind of when it's successful, when the chocolate comes out shiny and beautiful and snappy, wow, that's, that's when the magic <laughs> happens. It's like, okay, we're on it. <laughs> wow, I can't even imagine the, the satisfaction of figuring things out. Does it happen when you make chocolate that your mood can actually affect what's coming out? I mean, no. whenever I'm baking a cake, I know that if I'm a bit moody, my cake is not going to, some, something is going to be off. Okay. I think that's about attention. Hmm. Yeah. It's quite possible. My, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the mind is elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. So the little details, right? Uh, so yes, today we have, I mean, it took us uh, maybe uh, four, four or five months until we moved into a commercial kitchen. First we did shifts and then we took our own space and today our space grew and our space is growing more and we have a chocolatier on our team. She happens to be Israeli. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so, and we, and we have another woman working with us, uh, kind of, she's like the chief of operations, you know, do, taking care of a packet, uh, sending out orders and uh, kind of a lot of back end stuff. But anyways, we, and we have a tempering machine and we have big grinders. We have two big grinders and um, yeah. And now we're moving into the art bar. So that's incredible. That's just incredible. I think the chocolate, when I first saw uh, what it looked like, I thought these were just little works of art. It's so unusual and it's so uh, pleasing to the eye. <laughs> It's really nice. It is. Chocolate also has that aspect. When I said there's texture, flavor, but there's also the visual aspect. And it starts from packaging until when you look at the chocolate itself. Do you have a favorite uh, mold, like a, a certain shape? Or are you going a bit more traditional with just the, the squares and, uh, and what it looks like? So our mold that we, start, that we chose at the very beginning, and we still have the same one, is this asymmetrical mold. And it just, uh, it, it, it went really nice, I thought, with our logo. Mm -hmm. So does, uh, how does the, the tasting of a new product uh, happens? Maybe somebody comes up with an idea, hey, we should have this product maybe, we can have another new flavor, or how, how does it work? Sometimes it could be a, an accident, a mistake. Like, uh, so we wanted to do a chocolate with some coffee in it. Uh, one day we didn't have any coffee and my husband ran to the store to get some coffee and he put it in the chocolate and oops, they were caramel notes. <laughs> oh, he got co uh, coffee with caramel notes, oh. but this is really good <laughs> with a, as a milk chocolate, delicious. And that's like our top seller. Oh, oh that's so yeah. interesting. So it was like a happy accident. <laughs> yes. And, uh, or like coffee cardamom was a choice because it really connected with our cult, the culture we come from, but this continued because Americans didn't love it. It's a very particular flavor. Yeah. Yes. Or like, uh, just lately my husband met these chili, these people from Mexico who make this crunchy chili really special. And he brought some back. He thought this could be cool in the chocolate because chocolate and chili is actually a great pairing. Yeah, and it's very popular in the Netherlands. 
the salt and the chili and all these things. True, true. Lint have a, a chocolate with salt and a chocolate with chili, right? And lint know what they're doing. The flavor of cacao will pair very nicely with this, this, and this. And then you can do the more experimental stuff. But in the end, the top sellers will be those flavors that people want to come back to again and again. It feels that you're taking such a creative route to whatever it is that you're doing. So a lot of our conversations were about like parenting because I just had a little girl and I have a boy and I always look for fun inspirations. And you told me about this wonderful lullaby that you created for your daughter. And I thought it was so original. I've never heard about anything like this. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Sure. My first month of pregnancy was quite horrendous. I was like, what did I do? What is this for? <laughs> <laughs> I, even when, I don't know if you were familiar at the time with Varda Raziel Jacont. Yeah. 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 I, I called her radio show. You did. I did. And I said, I want to talk with Varda about why do we have kids? What's the point? And she said to me, it's to enrich, it enriches the experience of life. And that was a turning point for me, hearing that sentence. And I decided to take a doula, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a doula to accompany throughout the whole journey and then to do the birth with me. And she was fantastic. I met with her every week. She also got me doing all the, you know, the uh, ro uh, pelvic rotations, preparation, right, that. And someone, a friend, connected me with a woman who was kind of just starting out to work with voice. And just as a person who has always loved dance and self-expression and and my whole family sings besides me and my mom. But like, and they will always say that I'm uh, off key, that I'm always off key. That was me, like in the family. I don't know how to sing. And this just like, I don't know, I was, the whole experience suddenly of the pregnancy, right? This so physical experience. I just, I felt like I wanted everything to, to, to be engaged and go through some kind of something. And I totally uh, got turned down by this idea. So I went to this woman and she, she told me, okay, we're going to, you know, do this, uh, this uh, vocal work based on this specific method. And at the end, we're going to create a birth song. And this is a song that you will have for your daughter for the rest of your lives. Wow. And I was, you know, totally engaged in that journey. And, and that, that totally opened up my confidence in uh, using my voice in a, in a very expressive manner. And it changed the way I sing, you know, I'm not a singer and I don't do, I actually, I recorded myself singing that I posted it on a, some community. Like I, you know, I felt so confident about it, regardless of what it's not about, does it sound good enough to be, you know, professional or something. It was just about expressing myself. Of course. And so we have this song in, uh, in times of trouble. You know, I hug my daughter, even at the age of 15, and just swaying there and singing it to her, and then she'll join me. And we have this song. That is so magical. And this song is, is something that she knows from birth. It's something that accompanied her all yes. through the years, also in Costa yes. Rica and also through all the moments. Yes. I have goosebumps, and, actually. <laughs> so this is a song that I, I, I made up the words, very simple, the, the, the tune of it. And I even went to my brother's studio and he played the guitar very gently. And I sang it and I have a recording of it with the guitar. This is unbelievable. This is so such a magical experience and such a gift that... Who else can gift this to their kid? Just just the mother, you know? And the fact that you didn't you didn't feel too confident and somehow this pregnancy gave you 
that nudge, that confidence to go through with it. Imagine if you would say, oh, this is not good enough. Oh, this is not good enough. Then such a great gift would have just been uh, lost. I think there's something about all the hormones we have during our oh, yeah. pregnancy that gives us gives us this this whole positive euphoric outlook on life. I wouldn't even call it euphoric. I think it's just really positive and um, it typically not. I, I I don't know how it works across the board, but I think in general that's what these hormones do. They they really uplift, right? Yeah, I think uh, what is most common is the the first trimester and the last trimester. Let's not talk about that, but the middle one. Oh, the middle one is a joy. That's when all, all right. your creativity, all the projects, really come to life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um the the sharing yeah and apropos apropos what you do with the stories you know she says to me mom i want to hear stories i want to i want to know you better i want stories about you know from your life tell me tell me and i don't always have them in my mind right it, ah, the moment that she's asking i don't remember but then sometimes they come up and it often it's like when i'm dri when we're driving together in the car and and then, and she is so attentive to them. Like she'll always say, so wait, so, and then wait, and wait, so tell me. And then, and she's so curious about them. And, and uh, sometimes I have stories that I'm like, I'm not sure I should be telling this to her now. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, the, the inner filtering system. <laughs> yeah, there's one that I say when she's 18 or when she was younger, I was like, when she's 15, so. She got some new ones lately. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Yes, there's something about stories and in moments when we do something without thinking. So like driving, or there is a whole genre of coming up with stories or writing bits in the shower, just because your mind is somewhere else, completely somewhere else. And there is this beautiful quote from, uh, from Tom Waits when he was driving in the highway and then the song came to his mind. And he was like, talking to the muses, why are you doing this to me? Can't you see I'm driving? <laughs> I can't just stop at the side of the road and capture this, so this is not helping. That's maybe what he had to do, stop on the side <laughs> of the road. <laughs> this is so funny how, how these things work. And do you capture any of these stories? Do you make like a voice uh, recordings when you tell them when something comes to mind? I have not, but that's an idea, but... <laughs> Yeah, you know what, there's something about um, the, okay, so let's say I'm driving in the car with her and I start to tell her a story. So next time it will happen and be like, oh, wait, 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 turn on the recorder, right? Hey Siri, record. Yes, hey Siri, record. Oops, Waze, what's gonna happen with Waze? <laughs> oh, I just activated my Siri. <laughs> well, it works. Yeah. Um, there's something about the moment of recording. I think it requires maybe um, developing a relationship with the recording because it's just like when I dance and I record my dance. Um, for example, I cover the screen. I have two screens. So I cover the screen so that I don't see what, what I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like this aspect of okay, forgetting that it exists because it's like a witness, right? Mm -hmm. And once you have someone watching you, it changes your relationship with what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, it makes you more conscious. So, and I want it when I tell her the story, it's like I'm telling her in the most flowing uh, stream of consciousness kind of way. But so I guess there's like getting used to the idea, okay, we're recording. There's something that's interesting though. I'm going to try that. Maybe not the phone. Maybe you need like an old fashioned, I had like an Olympus recorder, you know, for my lectures in the university, uh -huh. <laughs> like a small thing, like a digital recorder that just records and you never touch it. You never look at it. And then after like a year, you just, you know, upload everything for the computer. And you're like, oh, that was such a good story. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually have a iPhone that is not in use that could be, for that purpose like oh, uh yeah. yeah keep it in my purse in the car car is a good place that's where the stories come out in the car absolutely the car and the shower it's really uh it's really fun yeah. 
Um, was there anything that you feel you did in an unusual way when she was growing up? Definitely. Um, my daughter is a storyteller herself. Oh. And we knew this from before she could even get words out of her mouth because she would just go blah, 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 about everything. She'd always have something to say. And my mom, she said, she's a storyteller before she had words. And eventually, uh, when we took her to a doctor when she was like uh, three and a half or so, and he said, she's a storyteller. She has high verbal intelligence. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is her, this is her core. <clears throat> Um, today she's like, oh, I don't know if that's what I want to be, you know, but okay, <laughs> she, <laughs> you don't have to be a storyteller. There are many things you can do with words, many things, most things, <laughs> most things. Exactly. I would love reading stories to her, but, um, apropos our discussion before about the anthroposophic way of doing it, we're in anthroposoph anthroposophy. They have this idea of you tell the story in a very neutral tone so as to leave room for your child's imagination to fill in. I just, I can't do it. I can't because like you, you see, I'm a, I'm, I'm an animated person. I can't, <laughs> I can't stop it. But, um, but that, I think, uh, the animated way I conveyed the story to her, I think that really gave her, she's quite an animated person herself. I think she picked up from that and also from my father who is an actor. So she has this in her, um, but something that I did for her that was, um, it was something that I did in as a means to help her move through difficulty to go through a transition in an empowered way. And I did this at the young age of, she was two or two and a half, probably two, it was two and a half. I was gonna send her to daycare in, uh, for the first time. And I chose so, an- So wait, 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 wait. So uh, you stayed home with your daughter until she was two, two and a half? Yes, I mean, I, I always was a free, most of the time I was a freelance. So mm -hmm. that wasn't a, that was a no brainer for me. But I mean, it is a big brainer when you have a little kid, totally changed my professional life. Yeah, so I stayed home with her until I also breastfed until two, two and a half. And then I sent, I decided I have to put her in daycare. And I chose an anthroposophic uh, daycare, which was lovely, a dream. Um, but, you know, I'm with her. 24 seven and then suddenly I have to send her to this new place. That's like, that's, that's hard. That's for both of us. Absolutely. So I had these finger dolls. Um, and uh, what I did is I, I did a, I, I did like a little theater with the finger dolls where uh, I played out for her um, little Alma and mommy, you know, going in the car and driving, 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 and where are we going? And oh, and we're going to this daycare, and oh, and we meet uh, this person and this person, and there are other kids, and and uh, we play and we have so much fun during the day, and and we eat good food, and and then mommy comes, and you know, we hug and we drive back home, and I just played that out for her like three days in a row, <laughs> so that it really, you know sits in her brain really well so that she's prepared. Yeah, those were, that was a wonderful, wonderful year for her. Oh, that's so nice. How did you prepare her for school? Oh, wow. Like first grade? I just went through this with my son uh, in the Netherlands. The second they turn four, daycare stops and they go to, it's called school, but it's like preschool, but it's in the same right. building with all the big kids. So right. They have a routine of five days a week. One day, like Wednesday is a short day, but it's no more napping. They bring their own food. It's very kind of uh, uh, interesting. <laughs> I think the Israelis, at least uh, some do have a similar um, uh, kind of, she had that at four. She had like this uh, uh, kindergarten inside the big kid's school. Mm -hmm. So that makes the transition to first grade much easier. Yes, absolutely. It is, it is quite easier. Okay, and how did you prepare her to move to Costa Rica, to, to the US, sorry? I have a recording 
no, this isn't for the move to uh, the United States, but so my husband and I got married in Las Vegas and my husband is not her biological father. So she came with us to the wedding oh. when she was, <laughs> she was uh, six, but I have a recording of, uh, of me preparing her for this trip. I have a recording of that. Yeah. Just, you know, talking about it, right? So this was always, always talking about like what it's going to be like. So at a certain age, it wasn't the dolls anymore, but having a conversation to prepare her, you know, like what it's about, what we're going to do and paint it in a lovely, lovely colors. And yeah. Did you have uh, a book or maybe a story that you can still remember that you would ask to hear every night? Was it like something that was reoccurring or was it like a different story, different adventure every night? She did, she did have one that she really loved. Um, and I don't remember what it is, but I was a children's book collector because I was an illustrator. I would get the books with the most gorgeous, like what for me were gorgeous illustrations. And I still have a little collection in my house because I, they, oh, they're so precious to me. Oh, I would love to see your collection. I, I can only imagine the illustrators that you would pick. Oh, the one that she loved. I don't remember what it was. Boy, I don't remember. Oh, that's okay. Don't. Yeah, it's, it's, she's 16, so I can imagine. That. Yeah, <laughs> too far. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of things happen. <laughs> well, I have to say that I'm... I'm when I first heard about the, your chocolate and the chocolate factory and everything, I, my mind, like my imagination was running wild. And every time I'm going through something, it kind of reflects in the bedtime story that I tell my son. And my son is a little bit like an engineer. So when you talk about like building a machine with a fan and with these different things, that's all he cares about. I think he would, he loves chocolate and he would care about that more than chocolate. So uh, I came up with uh, every evening, it was a story about chocolate. And some of the stories were really good. Some of the stories were not so good, but two kind of stayed. So he kept asking to hear about the whole process of making chocolate and I had no idea how you make chocolate so thank god for youtube and I was looking at how actually how do you do it and there was no like secret ingredient there is just a tiny bit of sugar that you add and they show you the the cocoa fruit and how wonderful it is and I was like oh maybe I can order an actual fruit and show him but it was like I don't know 40 euros for like three <laughs> and I was like okay we're gonna make it with paper <laughs> little beans inside so now that he thinks about chocolate he thinks about the whole process of Beautiful. making the chocolate and I wonder if it's the same with your daughter because you know how you work in a place and then your even your clothes smell like it oh yeah and smell is such a such a strong thing for our memory you know so whenever you kind of smell in a cafe like maybe a fresh roasted coffee or a bakery and chocolate these are such special uh, flavors and such uh, special uh, things that trigger your memories. Okay, I want to demystify something here a moment because when you work in a chocolate factory, your clothes do not smell like chocolate. They smell oh, like the no. acid, the acid that is released from the cocoa beans. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't know that. Maybe it should be like a fragrance, you know, like they made a special <laughs> candle with like a coffee smell. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. But that. when you walk it, when you walk into the factory, you do smell the chocolate. But what sticks onto your clothes is the acids that are released. <laughs> now we have a mechanism to 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 take those away. But um, whoever works very close to the machines, yes, that's part oh. of the. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you learn something new every day. This is right. incredible. Right. But um, other than that, what was your question? Uh, uh, chocolate, like a, like a process, like a whole thing. She totally knows. She totally knows. And she, if she'll sit with her friends and they'll open a chocolate, she will put on the whole show. Oh, I bet you're so proud. This is so nice. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, Th this is quite incredible. I'm, I'm incredibly grateful uh, for having this conversation. And I think chocolate for any parent, either it's a bargaining chip, which you really don't want to do for, for to make kids do something, <laughs> because this is the only, the one thing, if you're trying to handle a three-year-old or a four-year-old, you can somehow bribe them with chocolate. But I think- it's I think that's important. Northern Europe kind of thing. <laughs> I, or I don't know, maybe, I never did that. I don't yeah. know why. You know, I was I was talking to my partner about the whole idea of parenting and how we thought what parenting would be because we became parents pretty late. Uh, we were 34 and uh, we had a whole idea of how it's going to be. And then suddenly you have a toddler and it's a whole new species <laughs> of running around in your house and you're trying this way and you're trying that way. And then you discover like, Oh, chocolate. Oh, you really like chocolate. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, we can't overdo chocolate, but maybe we can connect it. To oh, totally. Sports. I don't know. Maybe oh, yeah. I can drive you with this. But this is not this is not the ideal way. I'm quite aware of it. But sometimes, you know, if you need to leave on time. Oh, just wait till the day when you'll be like, would you get off your phone? Would you get off your phone? What can <laughs> what can I give you to get off your phone? Boy, is there anything? Nothing. Oh my God, it's stronger than chocolate. A phone is stronger than chocolate. Yes. I wonder in 10 years what the new version of the phone would be. You know, maybe it's going to be just implanted like a neural yeah. uh, style. <laughs> yeah, it's going to come. It's going to come because this is this is not good for our hands. I know, or our neck also. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're working on it, I'm sure. Just humans aren't quite ready to be introduced, but it's it's close to being ready, the whole technology of it, I'm sure. Absolutely. Gila, it was such a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this and sharing yeah, your story. Thank you. This is really magic. All right. So now it's time for a very delicious bedtime story. There once was a boy called Kai who loved chocolate more than anything in the world. One day, his uncle sent him a package with a mysterious object. Inside the box, the boy found a note with instructions on how to make his own chocolate. Kai ran into the kitchen, put on his apron and read the first line. Step one, karate chop the pod. Hmm. Kai placed the strange fruit and hit it with his palm, but nothing happened. He looked at the note and then at the fruit. Maybe I'm not hitting hard enough? Kai took a deep breath and hit the cacao fruit once again. This time he focused all his attention on his hand. Crack! The fruit cracked right in the middle. Step two. Take out the cocoa beans and put them into a bowl. The beans felt slimy. They looked white and alien. Kai tasted one of the beans, but they tasted nothing like chocolate. He took the slimy part and put it into a clear bowl. Then he looked back at the note. Step three, cover the bowl and let them ferment for a week. Let them, what? For how long? Frustrated, Kai covered the bowl with a kitchen towel and went back to his book. His dream of eating his own chocolate seemed a million years away. Every day, Kai marked an X on his calendar. And then, finally, today was the day. Step four, ask your dad to help you turn on the oven and roast the beans until they turn brown. Kai sat in front of the oven and watched how the pale beans turned brown. Step five, peel the shell and crumble the bean with your fingers. Oh, that was fun and easy. The roasted beans began to look a little bit like chocolate. Step six, collect the cocoa nibs and place them in a bowl. Step seven, ask your dad to put the cocoa nibs in the blender and add a little sugar and blend it until it turns into a paste. 
oh, this already started to look more like chocolate. Step eight, take one of your Play-Doh shapes and pour the paste in. Make sure it's smooth. Step nine, put it in the freezer. And step 10, enjoy.